was saying, I, I really am pleased to uh, be here today to to join uh, John in 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 this um, uh, talking about his new book. And uh, like I said, basically, John and I met a couple of years ago when he was looking for um, first person stories, um, first person narratives of uh, folks who had lived here in the Napa Valley. And um, I'm really pleased that he's included um, my great grandfather's story, Jujo's story in his book, and that he's used um, that story uh, from Jujo's life multiple times in his book to illustrate sort of the um, larger themes that he discusses. What we thought would be a good way of um, leading, de dealing with this conversation tonight was to weave in some of uh, Jujo's personal stories with the larger story of the Chinese here in the Napa Valley. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. And um, I wanted to ask you, John, what um, got you interested? What got you interested in um, researching the history of the Chinese in Napa Valley? Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, and thank you, Jack, for for doing this. It it was an interesting journey. I am, um, I was a tech guy for many years, retired, and and I had a bucket list to do a, a master's in history from Harvard, and I was doing that. And one of the classes we did was the. Um, it was a history of U.S.-China relations. And as part of that, we were doing, I was like figuring out what kind of paper to write. And I happened to stumble across a single article from Miriam Hansen from the St. Helena Historical Society about Chinese workers in the vineyards in the late 1800s. And I grew up here. I mean, you know, family's been in the, in the Napa Valley for five generations. I did, you know, kindergarten through high school. And uh, I, this was not taught. I did not learn this when we uh, were doing local history and all that. And so I dug deeper and discover wow this there not only was it just in the vineyards which was important but actually throughout the napa valley in the late 1800s and well, where did this come from and i kept digging deeper and deeper and i was able to i did a um, presentation of the work in progress to the chinese historical society of america in san francisco and they responded very positively and said this needs this is story needs to be told and so i started the journey working closely here with the, at the napa historical society during the height of the pandemic and so as we're telling the story and to understanding how important it is, we also see the rise of anti-Asian hate with the, when the pandemic really started kicking up. And I said, this is something, you know, what can a historian do about this problem? I felt impotent, but no, actually, we could tell the story. We can actually tell how and uh, how the Chinese helped build the Napa, Napa Valley. So when the thesis was done, I said, well, let's turn it into a book, a general history book that hopefully everybody can learn and people, you know, in, in schools going forward can learn as well. So that's kind of what got me there. Um, John, as you point out in, in your book, my great-grandfather, Zhu Zhou, um, arrived from uh, China in, in 1874. He, um, what was really interesting, exciting to me was uh, John had done some research in the Napa Valley Cemetery here, and he had the headstones translated uh, from Chinese into, into English. And I discovered in reading his uh, research, his original research, that Many of these folk were from the same county as my um, great grandfather. It was Sun Wui County in the Seyup or four districts area of southern China. And um, apparently, maybe 80% of the, the Chinese laborers who came in to the Napa Valley were from the same district in China. So, anyway, my, my great grandfather, like a lot of these Chinese laborers uh, who immigrated, was dirt poor, he was illiterate. There was no economic um, way for him to make a living in China at the time. And he, like many of the other uh, Chinese men, decided to immigrate to America. Uh, luckily, my great-grandfather was able to, to book passage on the steamship between Hong Kong and San Francisco by working as a cabin boy and also bringing along um, 16 pounds of rice on his own so that he could defer some of the costs of uh, food on the travels and he was, he had one quarter pound left when he arrived in San Francisco months later. Um, so when he arrives in San Francisco, like a lot of these uh, Chinese men, the big job was how to find work. I mean, again, remember these, these guys are Ill illiterate. They, he's, my great grandfather spoke a few words of broken English, broken English. And, um, and basically, uh, how, do you, how do you find work? So he was able to, he told the family that basically the way he was able to find work was by going to the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association, which is also known as the Chinese Six Companies. And um, uh, what I wanted John to do was to tell us a little bit about the Chinese Six Companies and how they worked with labor contractors in bringing the Chinese into Napa Valley. 
just to mention that um, all through his life, my grandfather and my um, great grandfather uh, uh, were longtime members of their family association, which is the regional association, the Gong Zhao Association, which was one of the founding members of the Consolidated Benevolent Association. And I remember as a young boy being taken by my grandfather and my father and introduced to these old men sitting in the meeting hall in Los Angeles. So it was an important organization to them. And maybe John can elaborate on on how they were involved in the Chinese immigration. You know, it's really interesting, you know, trying to figure out, well, you know, we're talking about Chinese Napa Valley. Well, how did they get here? What forces brought them in? And, you know, we, we found really Chinese, there was tremendous poverty in China, you know, at the time. And there were kind of two ways that Chinese em, you know, em, emigrated from China to, to, to make a better life. You know, they either kind of voluntarily went or they were basically, you know, uh, captured and, you know, transferred against their, against their will. When they went against their will, they were called coolie laborers and they were in like Peru and Cuba and places like that, a lot of times replacing African-American uh, slaves that were no longer after the Civil War. But the ones that went voluntarily, like Zhu Zhou did, went to either usually California or Australia. And it was interesting in the um, Chinese, in the way they do it, they do the pay their own way, which was more, which was not that usual, or do the credit ticket system, which is basically, they would be, they would they would come over on on ships and would work and pay their passage back. So it's almost like, you know, so these these people that came over were incredibly entrepreneurial, right? This is something, this is not, you know, they they had to really work at it and they had to have confidence they would make enough money to pay for their passage back. And the Chinese six companies was instrumental out of San Francisco to getting that done. They would basically front load a lot of the money to, to bring these people over. And we think about the differences and one of the main things in, re, in, in doing the book that I thought was interesting is when I was doing the research for the thesis, a lot of the academic books, paint the Chinese six companies in kind of a negative light. Oh, they were taking advantage of these, these immigrants are coming over. And when I was doing the book, I worked closely with Connie Young Yu, who's a um, Chinese historian out of uh, San Jose area. And she helped really educate me about the, the positive contributions, the way the Chinese six companies worked, which basically they allowed all these immigrants to come over, found them work where basically helped with to be their home away from home, uh, especially for a lot of these men who didn't speak the language and all that. And uh, Jujo's story um, corroborated that. And so I think that was something also kind of lost to history a little bit, the instrumental nature, because it's not like the United States was really helping bring them over. They really, you need this kind of intermediary, intermediary organization that only not only brought over them and they kind of, in, and, the first thing, but then represent them to help them. And throughout the book, we you know I talk about several different kind of legal things that happened, trying to uh, push back against a lot of discriminatory, discriminatory legal practices. And the Chinese Six Companies was instrumental in that as well. So it's a really important organization that also does not really get the credit it deserves for helping bring over this entire generation of, uh, of workers. John, so my uh, great grandfather, Jujo, spent some 12 years of his life as a vineyard farm laborer. And he would tell the family that, uh, you know, people would ask him, well, what, what did you do? And basically what he said was it was um, from sunup to sundown, six and a half days a week, basically clearing um, vineyards, uh, planting grapes, harvesting the grapes, which was really difficult stoop labor, and then, um, and then pressing grapes. So um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about this, the, the, the whole history of the Chinese uh, involvement in the wine industry here in Napa Valley. Right. So it's interesting. I mean, the, it was a really confluence of events that caused that allowed the China, the, certainly the Napa Valley wine industry get going. It really happened. So we obviously a lot, we had a lot of Chinese laborers coming over with the transcontinental with gold mining, of course, first, and then transcontinental railroad after that. And so you had a fairly large labor force. And when the gold mines kind of petered out a little bit and the transcontinental Rail railroad was completed in 1869, you had um, a lot of labor that was available to do work, and they, there was a lot of gravitation toward um, toward uh, agriculture. And so they were they were all kind of throughout central Central California, Northern California, it was certainly in the late 1860s, early 1870s. At that time, that's when you had the first kind of European or first wave of European immigrants coming into um, Napa Valley and started planting wine. Right, so vineyards were a very important, um, you know, kind of nascent crop. So that happens like in the early 1870s. At the same time, civil war has disrupted trade from the East Coast and from Europe. And the vintners around, you know, St. Helena and Napa said, hey, we've got this opportunity, right? We're not having a lot of this, this, we don't have the competition 
from the East Coast or Europe, the local wines can really grow and really produce, but you need labor, right? And so they needed a cheap source of labor because transportation was so expensive, advertising was so expensive, everything is so expensive. The one thing they could control was labor. And so the Chinese were the group that they paid significantly less than uh, white workers. They'd do basically a dollar a day um, and with no room or board, right? Just dollar a day for, for the work. Whereas a white worker, you'd pay a dollar 50 a day or a dollar a day and provide them room and board. And so it was a, a you know, it was a very a cost effective way to do it. And an interesting side like to that, the other thing is, we are all used to seeing what vineyards look like on the mountains now. Well, when it was back in the late 18, 1800s, um, they were more planted like, it was like ground vines, right? So they were laying on the, they were basically on the ground or near the ground. And so you had to stoop over to pick the grapes and they called it stoop labor. And white workers would not demean themselves to do stoop labor. They thought it was beneath their dignity, but the Chinese workers didn't have any preconceived notion like, well, that's the work that needs to be done. So let's do it. And so it was not only they were the, there was a necessary labor force. They were here and they're willing to do the work. And so it was an interesting confluence that they really made it. Um, and they were the primary labor force in the vineyards from 1870 to 1900 or so. And in, by some estimates, we're about 80% of the uh, of the labor force. So the the the, the early vineyards would, and wineries would not be there for, except for the Chinese laborers. Um, John, so after leaving St. Saint, Saint Helena in the Napa Valley, my uh, great grandfather Jujo did many other occupations. Uh, he was a, um, a railroad worker on the Southern Pacific Railroad, then was a um, household domestic servant, houseboy, and then was a potato farmer, and then became a successful vegetable, um, I mean, uh, asparagus farmer. So, what I found really exciting about your reading your book was the number and the diversity of the occupations that the Chinese were involved in in the late. 19th century here in the Napa Valley. And I was wondering if you, and it, it's really amazing to me because I've read a lot of Chinese history and for a small area to see such a diversity of different occupations that the Chinese were involved in was pretty amazing. So maybe you could go through some of the other occupations besides the wineries that they were involved in. Yeah, it was really interesting because the, the vineyard, I mean, that was the original, you know, that was a thrust of the original article that I, I, I read and in the research, you know, the winery is kind of like if, if it was almost, well, I should say there were really no books written about the subject at all, academic or general history. And when it was mentioned at all, it was really mentioned in context of, of winery of like, oh yes, yeah, so we had a couple of, of history of wine, of, of wineries in the Napa Valley would mention the Chinese laborers, but it really wasn't, but nothing else was talked about. But when you start delving into it, it was really amazing. So back in the late 1800s, the vineyards were important to Napa, but they really weren't by any stretch the main industry yet, right? The, a couple of interesting kind of aspects to it, but, but all the main industries that were there, they were all powered by Chinese labor. So you had the quicksilver mines um, up in you know, the kind of the foothills of Mount St. Helena, which is mercury. Right. So that was a fairly popular, it was like the one mining, there was no gold and silver, but quicksilver uh, or mercury what was um, a, a semi profitable business then. And you had, uh, you had mines all across all up and down the valley, and uh, many of them were staffed either partially or fully with Chinese miners. Which of course, you know, you're you're working in these incredibly, um, you know, dangerous conditions. You can imagine going in there into mercury mines, right, and breathing the mercury vapors. And the Chinese would would do that, and they were like Chinese labor gangs, much like worked on the the railroads, would out be come in and work and work for the for the miners, for the for the mining companies. There was also hop fields. So you know, we think about well, what alcoholic beverages come from Napa? Well, it's wine, but it's actually hops were a very important crop around St. Helena, and particularly you know for beer, and uh, that was also kind of a wasn't quite as profitable as wine, but it was fairly uh, important, but it's pretty uh, capital intensive to build hop, to grow hops. And the Chinese laborers were the only ones to do that. And they were 100% the labor force for all the hop fields in um, in, in the valley. So it wasn't just wine, it was, it was you know, it was the, the, the mining, it was the hop fields, and of course the railroads, right? So a lot of uh, the Chinese were also brought in to build the Napa Valley Railroad, of which now, of course, you know, we see the wine train going up and down. But the Chinese built that, they had all the skills coming from the Transcontinental Railroad that they adopted for the Napa Valley Railroad. And then they stayed and maintained it. And they had depots in the, in fact, the largest concentration of Chinese residents in Napa in the late 1800s uh, was that was a dormitory about 90 Chinese workers in Napa at the at the basically the foot of the um, the Napa Railroad station, 
and then again in in Calistoga at the terminus, right? And so they were doing a lot of the building and maintaining uh, of, of the railroads. So it was just incredible to see all the different diversity. And of course, they worked on building the walls uh, up and down the valley. There's a lot of, you know, they call them Chinese walls, some of them. Um, they would do things like far help with farming and building. And then in towns, they were doing things like they were domestic servants, right? So we heard, you know, we heard from, from Jack that Ju Zhou um, was a domestic servant or China boy, and they would call them China boys no matter what their age. But they would be in the ho the households uh, doing, if you could afford it at all, if you were at all kind of middle class or above, you could afford it, you would want a Chinese servant, house servant, um, in who would take care of the household, you know, you know, that ma managing the household. Um, they did Chinese, there was laundries in, in town, there was um, the the tannery, right? So the Napa Valley tannery, Sawyer tannery was uh, very big. That's where you get Napa leather, right? That was that was actually um, uh, founded there in, uh, in Napa in the Sawyer tannery. And that was founded with Chinese labor, right? So they had like three or four white workers and uh, 20 or 30 Chinese workers to start and that kept growing as well. And so you have just, just up into everywhere I looked, all these different um, uh, different things they did, uh, you would have to get you, it was all through Chinese labor. And the only way to get the information, um, so none of this was written down, but the census was actually fairly interesting. Um, the census from 1870 and 1880, it was not, it's not digitized. I mean, you have the images, but none of it's unfortunately computerized, but going through with the county, you know, you're counting up, tallying up the different, the different, um, uh, occupations it was shocking that just the diversity that they had so so it was um there there wasn't as i said a single major industry that that was would have been successful without chinese labor which really um i think undersells the importance if we just think the wine is important obviously because looking back that's the major industry today but it was just it was just fundamental throughout the entire napa valley john my um great grandfather spent his time in the napa valley living in chinatown in saint helena and um, basically, he would tell stories to the family that uh, he did not, he could not read or write Chinese. And yet, it was very important to him, a lot of Chinese laborers, to send money back to China and to write to family members. And so they would go, he would go into Chinatown and uh, work with Chinese merchants there who would basically take dictation from him. And he was able to send letters back to his brothers in China, to his family in China helped to arrange for, the, for their immigration to America, and also to send money from his rather meager wages. He immediately started sending money back to China, and this was accomplished through merchants in, in, in St. Helena, uh, Chinatown. And of course, you know, it was there in the boarding house that all these people were speaking the same language, the same dialect. He was able to um, have the same, go to the store and buy the types of food that he was used to. And uh, basically what he told the family was that he would walk every morning from St. Helena's Chinatown to the vineyard and then walk back as night fell, fell in the evening. So maybe you could tell us um, a little bit about, you know, St. Helena's Chinatown and how it differed or related to um, other Chinatowns in the Napa Valley and, and the role of the merchants in 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 these Chinatown. Yeah, th yeah, th that's an interesting story. And actually, I, I think just to even talk about the first point you meant about uh, Juju being illiterate. That was another kind of revelatory thing as I was going through um, in the academic research I did, you know, it was pretty much like, oh, yeah, all the Chinese immigrants were illiterate. And um, it turns out it really wasn't the case. There were actually 20 or 30 Chinese newspapers that were in the San Francisco area and read frequently around here. So there actually um, was some level of literacy more than I think that we know. But one of the challenges with the book, and one of the interesting is we actually have no um, record of the Chinese themselves that were here. So there's no written record. Um, and if it wasn't for the oral histories of like that Jack put together, I mean, the gift that you've given, I mean, I, the, the historical community with your work is just is 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 amazing. And uh, where I think we're forever indebted to that because we, we really wouldn't know because you don't have the written history. So we end up having to use things like the newspaper accounts of the time and was still the Napa Register and the St. Lena Star and the, the, the Daily Talistogan that were there writing. Um, but they were all, they obviously were running for a very anti uh, Chinese slant. And so you have to really be kind of careful when you read all this stuff, um, what they're saying, and you have to read between the lines to get again the full, um, the correct, uh, uh, you know, interpretation of what's going on. But um, it was interesting to do, but the importance, I think, of Chinatowns can't be uh, underestimated. And that was one of the things also kind of growing up here, you know, I thought, you know, I'd bike around, we'd go downtown Napa, and, you know, we'd, of course, you know, downtown St. Lena. 
and discovering that there were Chinatowns up and down the valley. It's like, it, it was just mind blowing. And they were the major ones were in Napa, um, St. Helena and Calasoga, you know, the three main towns like, like today. And it's really fascinating because they all, they were very different. I mean, so what they were, were they were collections really of, of shacks of wooden shacks. Um, they were not the, the Chinese um, workers there could not or would not, didn't own the property they would rent. And uh, so the, the land was actually all you know, different, different, um, you know, white uh, Americans would own the land. They would lease it to the Chinese who would then uh, build, build the buildings. And there were, there were houses and hotels and opium dens and uh, China stores, the main stores that were, were there. And those were the important things, right? The store, the China store was the kind of the centerpiece of, of life for a lot of these immigrants. It was a little piece of home. So it was a store, like you'd go in there as a, like a grocery store, but it was also operated like a post office, uh, as, as, you know, we, as we heard. It'd be like a bank, uh, like a hostel, uh, like, not, you know, like a youth hostel. You'd kind of stay, you'd stay there if, if you needed to be. You know, it, it would help with, with money. It, would, it was your, um, it was aware you would, you would send money back back home and, and, uh, and, and get money. So incredibly important to the, um, the life of the Chinese immigrant uh, who was here. And the, I, I, I guess when you in large Chinatowns, towns, you might have a different store for every district in China that you came from. They weren't that big here. So it was one or two main China stores in each, each town. The one in Napa, um, was called Sang Li and it was, uh, Chan Wa Jack who owned that one and his son, Shuk Chan, uh, there's actually a plaque on the, the first street bridge, which actually has a little, uh, testimonial to, to Shuk. Uh, that was the, um, the big, the big one there in Napa, in St. Helena had uh, China, China stores and so on. But the the way that each city interacted with the Chinatowns was completely different and quite fascinating. So in Napa, it was just, I'm not sure, orientation right this way, I think, about one or two blocks to the Napa River. It was right along the Napa River, between the Napa River and Napa Creek. The orientation was a little different than it is now. And that's where Chinatown was. And um, it was it was considered part of downtown. And it was frequented by um, white townspeople as well as Chinese a lot. And there was a lot of, of talking about, you know, people going there for, you know, you know, obviously there's gambling and opium dens. That was kind of like some of the attractions, but just going in for the, um, going to the China store and buying things from China was very, very exciting. Kind of, I think a part of the cosmopolitan nature of Napa saying, and so it was basically, um, it was, it was, I think, Embrace might be a strong word, but was certainly kind of considered part of of Napa. St. Helena's was completely different. St. Helena's was on the outskirts of town. It was kind of built as you're going up north on the railroad or Highway 29, right before you, right where Gotts is, you know where that is, kind of right there, kind of the start going in. That's where Chinatown was there, and that was it was just kind of by itself. It was originally separated from St. Helena, but as St. Helena grew in the 1880s because of the wineries and all the kind of the growing of the Napa Valley, it, it slowly kind of getting a little closer to Chinatown and the St. Helena residents or some of the newspapers hated their Chinatown because it's what tourists and visitors saw when they went up Valley. That was the first thing they saw was this Chinatown and Chinese, as we talked about, they didn't make much money. Right. And the money that they didn't make, they were sending back home. And so it was a fairly impoverished, um, impoverished area. And so what you would um, and so there was this big animosity between St. Helena residents and and their Chinatown. And St. Helena probably had something like 2000 people about this time in the late 1800s. Or, and um, and uh, the St. The Helena's Chinatown had like maybe five or 600 people living there. So it was actually a fairly big proportion. And so there's this battle constantly of, of the St. Lena trying to kick people out and get rid of Chinatown and the Chinese staying there. Um, so it was very adversarial. Calistoga was a little bit different. That was Calistoga's Chinatown. If you drive, um, I think Lincoln Avenue is the main avenue. I think, you know, you go up 29, then you hang left and you go down the center of, China, of, um, of Calistoga, the railroad tracks. They were just on the other side of the railroad tracks because one of their main things they were doing is they're maintaining the Napa Valley Railroad in the, uh, the Calistoga Terminus. So they were they were there. It was a smaller one there, but there was also an opium den and there were um, gambling, slow gambling, and there were... Uh, you know, stores and things like that and some housing. So it was definitely the kind of the smallest one, uh, but it, it, there was also kind of a benign relationship there, but it was just this interesting, as Jack said, one of the things that made the book so interesting 
is that Napa Valley is just this microcosm of lots of different forces in a relatively small area. You know, I mean, heck, we got, we have vineyards and agriculture and mining and railroads and everything all within a relatively small area. And there's so, it was no different with Chinatowns, right? Very important to the Chinese kind of sense of community, but a very different kind of relationship that it had with all the different towns. So it was probably a fascinating thing. And of course, they're all gone now, unfortunately, completely. So uh, as you point out in your book, book um, John, when my great grandfather arrived in 1874, it was sort of walking right into the fire of anti-Chinese agitation here in the Napa Valley. Um, basically, he told my uh, grandfather stories of himself being beat up physically by what he called the white no-gooders, and uh, he sustained, you know, scars on his face and a broken finger from being beat up. He would tell my grandfather, my, my grandfather would ask him, well, did you fight back? And he said, no, you couldn't fight back. You couldn't fight back because the legal system would not allow you to testify against the white Caucasians who beat you up. But he told um, the family, and it was part of uh, his, his habit ever after, was that he would defend himself if he was under threat of death. So for the remainder of his life, he slept with a cleaver under his pillow and a loaded Colt 44. We still have the Colt 44 in our, in our family, and he would shoot it every once in a while. He never shot it in anger, but he had it there in case he needed it. And uh, he was an interesting guy because even after he became wealthy and he built a house for the red remainder of the family, he would live in a, a cabin solitary by himself away from the family with dirt floor, cleaver behind his head, and, a, and the gun. <laughs> so it was just a part of his... His, uh, he also told us that, you know, basically during this period of time, he, the, the um, exclusion acts were passed and he was forced to get um, certificates of identity, you know, and these were the only time in American history, I think, that a, an ethnic group was required to carry a card to prove that you were legally in the United States. We got original one. We have the family uh, documents. The original one was in 1882 or 83 here uh, in St. Helena, which at that time was optional. And then in 1892, after he moved to Los Angeles, he had to come back to Sacramento to get a duplicate card, which was then required by the Gary Act and had double photo IDs. You had to carry it with you at all times and show it to anybody who challenged your right to be in America. So um, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about this kind of, uh, Difficult time in, yeah, in, it's, in Napa. It's, it's really, it's really interesting, and some things you know, we, we think about it. What happened then? A lot of what's old is new again, and so on. So, just in in immigration history, generally speaking, in Chinese history in particular, the Exclusion Act of 1882 is the 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 thing that stands out. So that was, as as Jack mentioned, that was the first piece of immigration legislation that ever that it actually prohibited immigration uh, from a um, a particular country based on ethnicity and so it basically it said in 82 that no chinese laborers laboring class could emigrate to the united states so the first time in the united states history you know which had been generally speaking you know obviously we're a nation of immigrants the first one they did and it targeted the chinese uh chinese uh chinese work chinese laborers so merchants could come in and out but laborers could not and um, that was uh, it was it was very significant, right? And it basically it there was there was tremendous immigration before that, and after that, it pretty much uh, you know started drying off pretty quickly. People that were here could stay here, but the the issue was if you ever went back to China, um, you could not come back unless you had your identity card, and so that's why the identity card was actually so important. Um, and then after 1892, I think you couldn't even come back it, it come back with that. But the whole immigration policy um, really really ch um, ch defined the entire Chinese experience here. So there are a couple of things. So just briefly, and you, it's not not surprising even today. Early California, especially in the 1860s, 1870s, it was very much um, it was kind of split 50-50 politically. And so the different political party, every kind of every other term, it would switch between the um, you know, which which uh, the governor and the legislature, which which party had control. The only organized kind of um, group in the across the state was labor parties or was it labor? 
like the, the Working Man Association, the white laborers. And they weren't a very large number. They were only two or three or 4% of the population, but they were organized. And they were a single issue block. They were like no Chinese labor right? Because they thought it competed with the white labor. And so they would basically throw their weight behind whichever politician, whichever governor had more stringent anti-Chinese um, views. And so even though the, the people themselves, the, China, the governors may have not, you know, hated the Chinese, they could not get elected without courting the labor vote. And so they just kept, just kept going back and forth. And so you get these incredibly draconian labor laws a uh, much you know out of proportion to what was happening because that's what you had to do to stay in office you know sounds kind of familiar right um that's the and so that was the big thing and so in 1882 the exclusion act passed and that that stopped you know it took a couple of years for it to come through and but the, the even more importantly it's the that one's fairly well known. What's not as well known, and, and we don't go into a whole lot of dates, 1875 Page Act restricted the immigration of Chinese women. Okay, and so it was an act that was passed that was ostensibly passed to stop women of ill repute from coming to uh, the country. But really, it just it, what it what it actually did though it basically stopped all Chinese women from coming in because you effectively you were a, a female coming in, you, they put you through intense intense interrogation uh, at immigration stations before letting you in, and they were just like it was just not it was personal questions, and they just didn't do didn't do it. So what you had then was you had these, it was all men coming in, right? And the labor and what they wouldn't do, they just didn't want, and this is very intentional, what uh, politicians didn't want and the, the, the laboring people, they did not want Chinese uh, laborers coming in and establishing families and establishing communities and having second and third generations. They were kind of fine. All right, come on in, work, work for us, right? Help us build out this country, but then leave. Okay. And so a lot of Chinese, a lot of Chinese men, what they would do is they might marry in China right before they would come over, they would come over um, and uh, and then send money back to their families with the and they all most many of them intended to return not all but many and so it was just interesting thing of you had a bunch of just single kind of men sitting around and there were no um, no no there was no no generate you know not, nothing no families kind of units and so they were just kind of you know a bunch of single guys hanging together which is probably why Chinatowns were kind of um, not quite as put together as they might be if there were families. Um, but in the mid 1880s, and so you had this kind of thing where you had Chinese labor was shrinking after the early after 1882, but demand was still high and there was nothing and there was no other labor force to do it. And so their wages rose and they actually were able to go on strike and got higher wages in both the vineyards and the hop fields in like the mid in 1886, 1887. And that just incensed all the all the working class just well now you're paying the chinese more money to kind of have that have these kind of these jobs and so it started the anti-chinese leagues right and so every community had one napa had one saint lena had one calistoga had one these anti-chinese organizations that were like well how do we get rid of the chinese and the way each town went about it was as different as their chinatowns so napa they, they decided to go economic. Their big thing is let's do a boycott. That's how we're going to get rid of the Chinese and, and keep these company keep these businesses from employing Chinese. And so what they would do is they tried to, they had this, um, they had hundreds of, of citizens get together and the newspapers were pretty, you know, pretty much behind it. And they said, well, let's just boycott every business that employ all Chinese businesses. Of course you boycott them and all the businesses that employ Chinese. And so this got a lot of interest in everybody. They were like, apparently there was kind of a, a pass of, uh, there, I guess in town, you'd greet each other was, hey, do you favor boycotting? Do you favor boycotting? Let's boycott them. But it turns out it didn't go anywhere because um, if they realized, well, if you boycott all the businesses that use Chinese labor and you boycott all Chinese businesses, it would, it would grind uh, business to a halt in Napa. Okay, it would just crush everything. And so it kind of, once the economic reality of that situation, it kind of just fizzled out. And so um, Napa's Chinese, um, anti-Chinese um, um, kind of league was kind of intense, but it just didn't, it couldn't get any traction. St. Helena, though, took a different attack. They said, we're going to, we're going to be, we're going to basically use violence. Okay, we're going to get rid of the Chinese by, and what they did is, this was in the early 1886, 1887, right after they got, they, the Chinese struck and got higher wages. They said, we're going to meet, they, they had a meeting in downtown St. Helena, and they marched to Chinatown with a drum cadence. And I mean, they didn't have pitchforks, so they might as well. And they gave, they said, they, they kind of all these, these um, they, they all lined up in front of Chinatown and they said, you have 10 days to get out of town. You have 10 days to vacate. And uh, the Chinese held their ground. They, they, they was violent and they, they, and they did not 
uh, vacate. Some did. So, um, so Ju Joe left, I think, because you know, he had been in some other scrapes, but, but overall they, um, they stood their ground and they didn't uh, actually leave, but it really was the high point of, of, of what you, um, of the, uh, of, of the, of the intense, uh, thing. So violence versus, uh, economics. And it was interesting the way the two, the, the, the two, uh, two Chinatowns, uh, dealt, dealt with their, dealt with their, uh, their Chinese labor and Chinese problem. So, um, in 1886, as John mentioned, there was this march on Chinatown in St. Helena. And, uh, my great grandfather, Jujo decided it was time to light out of St. Helena. So he was always looking for better, you know, avoiding, avoiding all this anti-Chinese agitation and there were labor contractors hiring for the railroad in Oakland and basically he went on to become a railroad um, laborer on the southern pacific um, coastal portion of the southern pacific railroad and then uh, uh, basically uh, worked his way to LA became a um, household domestic in Los Angeles for a family in Chatsworth and then became a um, potato farmer made enough money to leave his his dream like a lot of these chinese men was to leave and go back home to get married and start a family so not everybody as john will talk to us in a bit not everybody in the napa valley were able to do it but he was because as he worked his way down california he was able to make enough money to afford to leave so he left uh, in, in uh, 1902 and went back to china um, his intention was to stay there forever like a lot of these chinese were and he built a house there he got married uh, he had two sons one of which was my um my uh uh grandfather and so the question is uh why did he come back you know otherwise i'd have, i'd still be in china and i'm not i wouldn't be here so basically uh he had a he had a business here in in uh, california and his he had helped his um, his uh, brother to immigrate, and his brother was supposed to send money back to support his life, his brother's life in China, uh, as any good brother would do. Unfortunately, this um, brother of his um, decided to sell everything, take all the money, and escape to Paris, France. So, <laughs> so, and then my my grandfather in China heard nothing from his brother. He's off in Paris, having a great time with all the family money. So he decided he'd have to leave and come back to America. Unfortunately, he had left his certificate card. He was not a merchant at the time. He was still a laborer and the, and the, and he, and the laws did not prevent him from coming back. But luckily he had some friends in high places, some Caucasian prominent business uh, associates of his down in uh, Los Angeles were able to pull strings with immigration. We have the documents that said that he's just landed as a, overstayed return laborer from instruction of the Los Angeles Immigration Department. So it was basically his buddies, Caucasian buddies who pulled strings, came back to America, um, basically became a very successful asparagus farmer in Los Angeles. He was dubbed the asparagus king of Southern California by the Los Angeles Times. And, uh, and uh, he was able to bring his, uh, then he became a merchant as John, there's a loophole that if you're a merchant, you can immigrate back and forth from China and bring your family back. So the reason why I'm here today was that he became a merchant, established his merchant status, and was able to bring his wife and his two sons, including my grandfather, from China back to the United States. My grandfather came in in 1918 at the age of 13. Um, so, you know, I think uh, what I wanted to ask you, John, was about, you know, these folks, what happened to the population in, in the Napa Valley. You know, my grandfather left mm -hmm. and did other people leave? What happened to all the other folks who used to be a big part of Napa Valley? Yeah, that is the thing because we look around now and there are very few Chinese citizens and you won't, you don't find that. And even back in the late early in 1900s, there weren't that many. And the bottom line is we actually don't, I mean, there, there, there were not close records, but effectively what, what happened was the, in 1882, we had this, the stopping of the immigration, and then you, it took a while for that to go through, right? So again, nobody was kicked out, I mean, you know, because they would have wanted them to, but nobody had to leave, but just, I think the, the work was hard, and the, uh, you just, after, in basically, in the 1880s, 1890s, you, people, st they started kind of, you know, fading, and, and, and the population started going down. There were not 
then we, we know some reasons why, because there were not second and third generations to kind of take up the mantle. We had some people were able to go back to China, which was kind of their dream. Others, you know, died here. And if you go to Tulake Cemetery, you will see uh, there's a county, they call it a county section, but that's where about 100 Chinese um, people were buried. There's only about seven tombstones left. The rest of them were all wooden, so they were all burned over the years. And then they were buried in, uh, in St. Helena Cemetery as well. Um, or they would go back to um, I'd like San Francisco and, and Oakland. Um, so the, they kind of kind of faded away a little bit. The, um, the other thing is that in the late 1800s, uh, wine became a lot less. Um, there was a depression and the, the early inklings of the forces that eventually became prohibition. And so the demand for wine went, um, went way down. Uh, the other thing, one of the, one of the other reasons that the China, that Napa wine had a prominence in the 1870s was because there was this blight called phylloxera, which was decimating the the vineyards in Europe, that made its way over to Napa, and so all of a sudden the, the um, Napa uh, Napa wines were Napa Valley wines were having the same same situation, and uh, so the all the the a lot of the wineries had to replant all their all their uh, vines, and they planted them uh, further apart. And up on the three foot stakes like we're used to now, so that it's more, it's much more efficient to harvest, and you could use um, the more mechanical means started coming into things. So you didn't need the large scale labor they used to, so they could actually employ just, um, just uh, you know, white a few white laborers instead of a whole bunch of Chinese laborers. And of course, we have the problem too of the Chinese weren't uh, allowed to own things, right? And so they couldn't. They they had they were just a laboring class, and so if labor wasn't there. They uh, uh, they were um, they they had they had to leave if the work if the work wasn't there, and that basically just kind of decimated the whole population. And by the early 1900s, there was almost nobody almost nobody left. Uh, no no Chinese left. They were they were replaced. Um, uh, as we kind of know, we have the, the mythos now of um, the Italians. So the Italians came over in the late 1800s, a little more a little more acceptable working class. A lot of wineries were on the market then. They were allowed to. They they knew how they could work the they could work the fields because they knew about wine from Italy, and they were allowed to own property. So they bought these distressed wineries. Families did, and they would work the fields and own it. Chinese were not allowed to do that. They could have done it. They probably would have done a good job, but they weren't allowed to do it. Italians were, and so we all think of Italians as kind of our the founding, or a lot of times the founding kind of uh, uh, vineyard workers and whatever. But it was really just because the Chinese had done that kind of some of the work, and they kind of came. They were they had the economic advantage to do that. So, yeah, so it's quite, it's quite a story uh, that they, uh, you know, then they then they were almost completely now, now we don't have uh, almost any, almost no uh, permanent or, or archaeological uh, evidence that they were here. So John, I think we only have a few couple minutes to wrap up. It, could you, do you have any closing thoughts or, or ideas about how we can, besides your book, how we can um, bring this legacy of the Chinese in the Napa Valley back to uh, everybody's knowledge. Yeah, you know, it's it's an important thing. I mean, the book is a starting point, but the book is, I think it's just about awareness, right? I mean, if I, I think there's a couple of things that are important. Um, if you look around, if you want to say, well, there are there monuments to the, the Italian contributions, and of course, we've got, you know, wineries and, you know, with either German names or, or Italian names, but there's no monuments to the Chinese um, there. We, you know, we could do more. We have the China, we have the little moon park uh, right there at the foot of First Street Bridge, right? That overlooks where Chinatown was, right? Having some sort of monument there, having some sort of, I think, physical uh, notion of, you know, of, of celebrating where Chinatown was and up and down the valley in St. Helena, I think is 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 very important. I personally, my, my thing is, um, this needs to be taught in schools, right? I mean, when we are learning, it's not more important than what we're learning today about local history, but it's part of our local history. And so I think getting it and so that people understand, if we think about going back to why this is important with anti-Asian hate and other things that we've seen, I mean, we're just, you, people are ignorant about what uh, all different groups, especially, you know, but Asian and Chinese in particular did for us here. I mean, I think for, for the, I think for it to be taught in schools, so we understand, yes, George Yant was important when he came for, for, to Yonville, right? I mean, the, it was important for the missions to, when they, when they developed um, California, but to actually understand the Chinese contribution, I think would just help. I think that, that being part of our education is we understand how everybody in the United States has contributed um, is so important. So that's my goal actually, is that we actually have that be just, make it part of that. So we just all know, we all know what's going on. So you see a Chinese, you know, there's a Chinese labor. It's like, well, that's, that's what, what um, we wouldn't, Napathy wouldn't be here today without them. So that's, that's, that I think would be my dream for what we could do. 
All right. Thank Thanks a lot.